everybody. This is Mike with One Stop Co-op Shop. We're doing a tabletop simulator playthrough of a game that I'm super excited. This is literally my first seeing of the game with you all, so we'll be learning it together. This is Burn Cycle, the game coming to Kickstarter from a Chip Theory game this coming Tuesday, uh, the 10th of November. And I'm here with an awesome guest, Shannon Wedge. She is the, uh, the rules master and also wears many other hats at Chip Theory Games. But Shannon, thanks for making the time here to teach us the game today. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, it's awesome to have you here because I know you'll uh, get me going the right direction with this one. And uh, we are doing this on Tabletop Simulator. Uh, Chip Theory should be sending out prototypes to some reviewers uh, either end of this week or into next week. So we'll try to do another video or two, maybe a review and another playthrough with the live prototype. But for now, we're going to make it work digitally. And this is kind of a digital theme anyway, so it's not too off. All right. So uh, Shannon, I guess we're... Gonna get right into it. Uh, for those who don't know, Shannon was just reviewing the theme for me. Burn Cycle is about uh, humans went extinct, robots began to rule the earth, and then the robots had the a terrible idea of bringing humans back, and now the humans are subjugating the robots. So we are trying to break into a building, get to the top, and defeat uh, a CEO, who is, I guess, one of the masterminds behind this robot enslavement. And yeah, we're going to see how it goes. I think, uh, Shannon, you said you wanted to play through just one floor to kind of give a taste of the game for this video. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's what we'll do today. Awesome. So, uh, Shannon, uh, you are in charge. Take it away. I'll try to move my uh, camera around <laughs> so they can see the stuff you're talking about. So walk us through the game. What are we doing here? Fantastic. So as you said, we are trying to get to the top of uh, this building. We're playing the Need Chain Corporation, which is a fulfillment company. Um, there's a, a few different corporations and each of them will have completely different layouts, objectives, that kind of thing. Here's our setup for floor one of Need Chain. What we have to do is clear three floors. So on the first two floors, we are going to draw some objectives. Um, we have to complete our objectives and then get into the elevators, the safe zones. And that's what will let us go up to the next floor. Um, we would do that again, but of course, on the second floor, things get a little tougher. And then on the third floor, there would be a, a special objective to get into the CEO's office. Uh, and if we do that, then we would win the game. Now, the way that we lose the game, um, there's a threat track over here. If we reach the end of the threat track, if we get up to 26, then we automatically lose the game. We also have three bots in our party. There's always going to be, every player is going to control a bot, and then you have an extra, which is called your command module. We can both kind of control the command module, but if the command module is defeated, then we automatically lose. If we are defeated, we don't automatically lose, but then we, we take over the command module, and anyone who's been defeated can only control the command module at that point. Now, quick question. Is Transmitter a fully fleshed out character that I could control and like Processor could be the command module or are there some that like can only be command modules? No, they all, um, and actually Transmitter was on the wrong side. Oh, there we go. Um, <laughs> but the, the card flips over and this is actually going to be um, a neoprene mat and then you slide the card um, underneath it for whichever bot you're playing. Neoprene mats? I've never heard of chip theory games using those. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a, it's a novel concept for us. And by, by the um, way, I should say for those not familiar, <laughs> I don't know how you couldn't be familiar, but Chip Theory Games does uh, Hoplomachus, the Hoplomachus series, uh, Too Many Bones, Cloud Spire. So yeah, neoprene and chips and amazing components and great gameplay. You know the drill. Yeah. So and, and in terms of what we're looking at here, uh, we would have this mat here is one giant sort of blank mat with these squares. And then these are all individual smaller neoprene rooms um, and there's a bunch more as well so that when you make other floors you can use different rooms oh that's awesome okay so lots of variety from play to play that's great yep absolutely in this game we are essentially taking actions to do stuff it's a it, we're calling it an action sequencing game what's going to happen is we're going to end up with what's called the burn cycle right here on our on our network mat here. Every chip here represents an action you can take. So if I was taking a turn, um, I can move my, the bead here just indicates which action you're on. So if I wanted to, I could move here and I could take any action. 
and then I move it down one more and I take any action and down one more, any action. But if I'm on the, the tech symbol here and I take a tech related action, I get a bonus for that action. Ah, so you're not um, limited, but you have kind of incentives to do certain things. Exactly. So if it's if the first thing I want to do on my turn, for example, is open a door for here, for example, um, I might, I could even choose to skip the tech action and go straight down to the security action here, which would give me a bonus in opening a door. Um, so I'd be I'd be giving up a potential action on that turn. So that's what we call it action sequencing. So nothing, it's not programming because you can do any action. If you can be efficient and do the right things in the right orders and skip the right actions at the right times, then you can you can get more done. Now, are we building this burn cycle as players or is it randomized or some mix of the two? Yeah, so uh, the way that it gets built at the start of the game it's going to be, if we look at our cards here, it tells you that you have two to start and then uh, access here has a third and a fourth that you can unlock by paying for them. So at the start of the game, you'd be contributing a utility and a tech chip into, into our, our pool. And then processor over here is contributing uh, two techs with the possibility to unlock uh, a utility as well. And then if we look at the board, for in terms of starting spots, we're gonna start somewhere outside of the building here. And if we decide to start on a square that has a symbol, then that's an extra chip we get to put into our bag as well. And then the, the last thing related to the burn cycle over here is uh, on processor. So your command module is telling you we our burn cycle starts with three slots unlocked, and then we as players can spend our power to unlock the fourth and the fifth slots. So those just kind of get randomized. We fill out depending on how many slots we have. And then we also would get to make a, a reserve. We'd pull the rest of the chips out of the burn cycle bag and choose three of those chips to put in our reserve. It's three because there's three bots in this party. And that would be just sort of a, an extra stack of chips that's sitting here. You can do a few things with these chips. They're really helpful for opening doors uh, and keypads, which I'll show later. And then the other thing is that you can always swap out. So these will often get locked out, um, or even if they're not locked out, you can swap them out for chips that are in your reserve to change your burn cycle. So that's the burn cycle itself. In terms of the actions that you can take, there are five main actions and they all correspond to one of these. So let's start with uh, physical actions here at the top. There's a couple different physical actions. The most common one is of course movement. And a lot of your actions are going to use dice. On your board here, you've got uh, these pegs. And I do want to apologize because these boards are actually really outdated. There's a lot of information on it. You don't need it all. Um, and there's a couple things that are missing. So everything over here on this left side, you're basically going to ignore. <laughs> um, and then there, there's two different spots for dice here, but there's actually a third level of dice that, that we don't quite have a slot for. And we'll just have to kind of mark that. This top spot, the spot that's marked AP basic, um, is actually your, we're going to call that your power bank. All right. Um, we populated that with these stats here. So that three slash three is what is telling you, you got three power, and then you also have three advanced dice, which are, uh, which are these orange ones here. Uh, and your power bank does three different things for you. So the first thing that it does is it tells you how many basic action dice, these yellow ones that you uh, get to put in your dice pool on your turn. The second thing it does for you is it is your health essentially. If a guard is standing beside you, then they're going to hit you and you're going to have to remove power. And then the third thing that your power does for you is it's also um, kind of acting essentially as XP. So as you complete objectives um, and do different things, you're going to gain power and you can just leave it there and that's going to contribute to getting more basic action dice. Uh, but you can also spend power in order to buy all kinds of different things. So we've already talked about some of those things. You can unlock uh, you can unlock more chips for your bag. You can unlock each bot has three special abilities um, that you can unlock. They cost three, four, and five. 
uh, respectively, but you don't have to buy them in order. You can spend power on upgrading your burn cycle with more slots. You can also spend power on special abilities that are in your command module that will kind of help the whole team. And then there's also occasionally mods that would come out, which are kind of specialized equipment that you can spend power to equip to your bot or sell for power if you don't want the mod. Yeah, so those are kind of all the all the different things you can spend power on. And the last thing you can spend power on actually is upgrading your dice. Um, so you can spend two power to get another advanced die. And then you can spend, I don't, I don't have it anymore, but you could spend two power and an advanced die to get an elite die into your dice pool. Now, you said power was your life. If, like, if I right at the beginning of the game was like, I want more advanced dice and I spent two of my three power, uh, would I then only have like basically one life for a guard to take away? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> you'd, you'd, you'd be taking a risk. So in other words, um, yeah, d d don't do that. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's all about balance, making sure you keep yourself with enough power that you're not going to die, but spend, spending it where you need to in order to, uh, to get powered up. And you said you gain more power through completing the objectives on each floor, correct? Yes. Yeah. There's a few different ways um, and, and they'll come up as we play. The, the last important stat as it pertains to power on your bot is this the eight here at the top. So that's your that's your max power. You can actually hold um, 10 power total. But if you start your turn over eight, then you have to spend down to eight on processor. And I think that number is uh, even lower over here on over here on access. It's seven. So if you're ever over seven, then at the start of your turn, which is when you spend your power anyways, you just you have to spend power until you're uh, not over seven. We'll go back to the actions you can take. Um, so at the start of your turn, you're going to build your dice pool. So if we're playing processor over here, that would be our dice pool. Movement, you can roll any number of dice you want, including zero. And then... Uh, the numbers on the dice are, are what are called AP action action points. Um, so if I, I would choose how many dice I want to roll, I would roll them. Um, and then I can move up to that many spots. And then what would happen is any die that's used, is uh, any die that you rolled and got AP, even if you don't use it, is uh, done for this turn. Blanks actually go back to your pool, so they're good in that way. Just for my own curiosity, what's the distribution looking like on uh, yellow versus orange? Yeah, so uh, the yellows here have, I think, two blanks, three ones, and a two. Uh, the orange here are guaranteed a one. So they've got three ones, two twos, and a three. And then your uh, elite here are uh, four twos and two threes. And what but, is that? Is that like a reroll or reuse symbol? Yes, exactly. So uh, half the sides have this reroll, so that would let you reroll any of the dice that you had just rolled. Oh, nice. Okay, so that does. I guess that also means though that you will never keep an orange or a red because you're never going to roll a blank on it. Correct. You're 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 guaranteed to get something on it, which is which is generally good. But yeah, you're never you're never going to roll a blank, so you're never going to get that get that back. It's always going to be spent. So with movement, as I said, if you if you take um, a physical action while on the, the physical action type on your burn cycle, you get a bonus. The bonus for movement is that uh, you get plus two to whatever you rolled. And that's why you can roll zero dice, because if you're on, if you take a movement action on that, and even if you roll no dice, you can still move up to two spaces. Everything in this game is orthogonal. There's no diagonals whatsoever, so... Don't have to worry about diagonals. Um, and then the other thing with movement, you can give almost all of your actions to transmitter. And what's special about movement with transmitter is you can actually share it with him. So if you if you use that too, you could move yourself and transmitter one each. Uh, doors are all locked, and that's what this red dot is here. So you can see that that and these blue slashes are, are what's going to indicate to you that that's a door. Um, and everything is locked up right now. Um, we'll get to the we'll get to the unlock action in a minute, um, but the second physical action is engage. 
Engage is going to be used really rarely. Um, there's a few different things you would use it for. It's sort of your your brute force option, mostly. Wait, are um, you saying I can't just go in guns blazing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can. So uh, you had just mentioned walking through walls. Um, you can't normally walk through walls, but you could use an engage action um, to roll your dice. And if you can roll a total of 10 or more, you can smash, you can smash through a wall and walk through it. <laughs> um, the other thing you can do if you're beside a guard um, which are these guys here, they're the bad guys, and you roll 10 AP or more on your dice, you can completely disable it, and it's basically not doing anything for the rest of the game. Rolling 10 AP is going to be tough, especially at the beginning of the game, and that number does go up as the floors go up, so it's actually 15 on floor 2 and 20 on floor 3. Ah, oh, that's easy. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, like I said, it's generally your your brute force option. Now, would I have, if I tried to do one of those options and I was using a physical uh, chip, would I get plus two to the results just like for rope movement? Yes, you would. Okay. Exactly. That would need an eight. Yep. See, even, even more within my reach. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm going to smash walls the whole game. <laughs> and then the, the last thing you can use engage for is um, to... Essentially, if you try to smash the guard, you're going to catch his attention. Um, so let's set something up like, um, like this. So in this situation, uh, you've got a guard that's adjacent to you, um, but he can't see you because there's a door in between you. But you could, you could use an engage and roll any number of dice and say you're not actually trying to kill him. You're just trying to catch his attention and roll zero dice then he's going to see you and he's going to pursue you. Um, sometimes you need to bait the guards to accomplish certain goals. That's a, that's a, just a way of like baiting the guard to follow you if it's not going to. So it's like um, a Metal Gear Solid knocking on a wall or throwing <laughs> a like little a... Bit, yeah. yeah, okay, got it. <laughs> um, so that's the engage action. Um, the next two actions are the tech actions. So that's the green tech. Uh, there's two different things. The first one is terminal and that's these keyboards that have been preset on the board. Anything that's red outlined is the stuff that starts. Um, so that's why we've got a guard in this room and that's why we've got uh, a crate sitting over here as well. And all of these were determined by the particular corporation we're going against. Is that right? The room setup is determined by the corporation. All of the rooms sort of start with a terminal. There's a potential that it's broken, but we'll talk there later. Um, if you move on to a terminal, then uh, you can take a, a tech action to access the terminal, uh, drawing a terminal card. So there's no, there's no cost at all to drawing a terminal card. Um, but the cost of the card is going to be on the other side. So you can see mo a good majority of them have a security check here, something you have to do um, in order to move on on the card. So this is two AP. You could roll any amount of dice and you'd have to get a total of two or more. Now, Shannon, do I, do I draw the card and then decide how many dice I want to spend or do I have to uh, commit my dice before I draw? No, you draw the card first. Uh, see what it says, and then decide how many you want to roll for that security check. And then if you pass the security check, you can pick one of the other options and do uh, the AP roll for that. Oh, so so I would build two dice pool. I would have to first build the dice pool for the security check, and I might overspend, and then I have to build a second dice pool for comms or network in this case. Exactly. And that's the, that's the interesting thing about your dice, right? You're trying to roll as few as you can but sometimes you really want to ensure a result. Um, so it's that, it's that balance of, of spending to ensure a result or saving for something that might come later. Shannon, my, my like favorite thing is resource management in games. So you're, you're, you're killing me here already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's all good. It's going to be great. So um, that's a terminal. Now the bonus, if you do this on a tech action, is that you get to completely bypass the security check. Oh, wow. I mean, I guess it's still the same two free in this case, but that, that's that's big because you can totally avoid like overspending or missing on the, the first dice check. That's great. Yep, exactly. So yeah, just keep in mind that terminals usually have a dice spend, a die spend. So you generally don't want to access the terminal if you don't have dice. Um, 
because by accessing the terminal, it's going to go away. So you've really only got one shot at each of these. Uh, okay. Got it. Um, so that's the terminal access. And then the last uh, tech access is called wireless access. You can do that from anywhere. All you have to do, you can see on the back of the wireless access card, it's another security check, but it's straight up two action dice of any kind. So you don't even have to roll them. You just have to give them up. And then you'd flip the wireless access card, and it's usually going to give you uh, something you have to do in order to access the network. Okay, so in addition to paying the security cost this for this one, I would have to have five dice left over to put to the network. Okay. Now, uh, w would the card just like fail if I had fewer than five dice left, or is it up to five? Uh, correct. It would fail if you couldn't do it. Um, and then you just wouldn't access the network with that action. You bypass that security check, those two action dice, if you if you do it on a tech. The wireless access gives you gets you over here on the network. Uh, I'm actually going to save talking about the network for a little bit because it's sort of uh, separate from everything else you're doing. It tie it ties in, but it's got completely different mechanics. So we'll talk about it last. That's it for tech. And then the last one is security, uh, sorry, utility. And there's a uh, utility, the only utility, abil uh, the only utility action is called keypads. So two different things can have keypads. Locked doors have keypads and crates have keypads. So if you're adjacent to something with a keypad, you could take a uh, utility ac or the keypad action. This should say two AP on the back of this card. Sorry, we don't have the updated ones. It costs you two AP to uh, to find the keypad. Now wait, is it is it two AP or two action dice like wireless access? Two AP. So rolling any amount of dice to get a total of two. If you're successful on that roll, and and the bonus doesn't let you bypass that roll, you draw a keypad card. You throw it. Uh, on the other side of the door and flip it. Ooh, that is a terrible example. Of card. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that is a lot of one icon. <laughs> uh, then we have a keypad um, that you can try to bypass, yet with the same action. Um, you look at the floor that you're on. So we're on floor one and uh, there's the movement icon there. So what we need to do to bypass that is one, if we have if we are, have you done it on a utility action, we automatically get to bypass any one symbol on this. Most level one uh, keypad cards only have one symbol, so if you do it with a utility, you have a good shot of just opening that door. Um, other symbols that can show up on these cards, the most common ones are these the action types. So that movement, for example. Um, the way that you would now open this door is to either go up to your burn cycle reserve and discard a movement from your reserve. Or if you had a physical lower than you on your burn cycle track, you can jump to it in order to use it. But you're giving you're basically giving up actions to do that. Now, what about like floor two has no action symbol? The lightning is a shock that's that's damaging you by one. So you lose one power. The other symbol we have on here is uh, the the signal. And that's going to going to put a ping on your network, which we'll talk about later. Um, and then some of them have a die on them. So there's actually a die you can roll. And that die is going to tell you what symbol uh, would fill that slot. So the only thing you can't bypass with, uh, with the utility is the shock. You can never bypass a shock. You just got to take it. All right. So those are keypads. If you manage to unlock it, then uh, we would throw one of these green pegs over the red. And then that door is unlocked, free for you to move through back and forth unless something comes along and locks it again. Uh, but nothing is relocking doors. No guards are relocking doors on the first floor, but something else could. And those are those are all of your actions um, that you can take outside of the network. 
transmitter can take any of those, but movements, you'll only we can split with him. The rest, we would have to like spend our own action for him in our own dice pool. Is that right? Correct. The only thing that transmitter can't do is access the wireless. Okay. Cause we don't want to deal with three players worth of <laughs> <laughs> Wi-Fi passwords floating around. Okay. Got it. <laughs> yeah. So no, no wireless access, but everything else transmitter can do um, using, using your resources to do it. Um, and transmitters like on your team. So you're going to want to be moving him. Eventually you've got to get transmitter onto an elevator with you in order to leave. Transmitter is really good as for acting as like a guard decoy, um, for like pulling guards certain ways. If you're, if you're trying to bait them some way. Now, how does he get damaged though? If like he takes a shock or a guard attacks him, he's got his own power bank here. Um, he starts with five. If you complete any objectives, it's group power, so uh, transmitter will also get power from that. Transmitter can't spend its power in any way. Even even the power spends that are on its card, those are for you to commit. If you take over transmitter because your bot dies, then you can start spending your power. I, I think I said it wrong. Do we use his uh, dice pool if we spend the action for him to act? No, so he doesn't get a dice pool at all. Oh, okay, you're spending okay. you're spending all of your own resources on transmitter. So his power is basically just there as a life pool. Yep, exactly. A few more features we'll look at on the board here. Um, every room you can see over here has some some icons on the sides. So the first one, that white one, is a camera. There's there's some uh, terminals that will allow you to surveil rooms. Um, and only the ones with cameras are surveillable. The reason that's important is because you don't actually know what's in this room right now uh, before you've entered it. The first person to enter the room is going to roll the room dice that are in there. So that's what this is telling you here is that there's one room die in that room. Um, and the symbols on the board are telling you sort of what's possible. So this room has a possible guard. Um, it doesn't have, this would be a crate, but there's no possible crates in this room. So if you rolled that, it wouldn't generate anything. If you rolled uh, this side, then it actually breaks your terminal. <laughs> um, but if there was a crate possible in this room, it would come unlocked. This is the side that tells you that we would put a guard in this room on the symbol. And then um, this turns your terminal into a super terminal. Super terminals are great because uh, that card we looked at before, um, if you access with the super terminal, even if you're not on a tech, you bypass a security check. And instead of picking one of the two options, you can do both of them if you want. Um, other features in these rooms, we have hidden spots here. If you're standing on a hidden spot, you can't be seen by a guard. <laughs> so, so transmitters like just blending in with the ficus or whatever. <laughs> yeah. The the exception to that is if the guard sees you before you hide, you're not hidden. <laughs> yes, um, that makes sense. So yeah, if there's a guard standing here and he like sees you on this spot, moving here doesn't hide you. He saw you go there. <laughs> um, but if you're standing there and then a guard starts moving around in this room, he won't see you. Over in the warehouse here, we have these. Are, this is the crate symbol. So the warehouse, uh, fittingly, does have a couple spots for crates. Has a bunch of boxes you can hide behind. And are the ones um, and twos like you fill the one first, and then the two if you get a double? Exactly. Yep. And then uh, this orange symbol only corresponds to some objectives. There might be an objective uh, that tells you what that is and wants you to do something with that spot, but otherwise, it's not relevant. Um, safe zones are the elevators. You're trying to get on them to get up to the next floor. Uh, guards can't see you there, can't follow you there. They are safe. Um, but you can't, uh, all you can really do from the safe zone is then control transmitter. Uh, there's not really any other actions you can take once you're in the elevator. Oh, I, I so can't move back out? You can move back out, but you can't like go you can't go play on the network oh, okay, while you're standing you. in an elevator. The Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi is a little spotty yeah, in there. Yeah, I mean, of course, the, those walls <laughs> are so, so thick. Uh, question for you back to movement that kind of the yeah, safe zone just brought up. Can we move through each other or is it too many bones rules where you can't move like onto another chip? Correct. You can't move through other chips. You can move through on and through terminals. 
Um, you can't move through locked crates, but once you've unlocked a crate, um, it'll be an equipment that's sitting there and you can walk through that space to pick up the equipment. But yeah, and that's a huge part of this is the guards are going to be kind of patrolling around and sometimes they get in your way um, and you've got to kind of be creative in figuring out how to get them out of your way, how to bait them without letting them get to you. So yeah, let's let's talk about the guards. Um, there's kind of two different, there's three different types of guards in level three and they act differently depending on whether they're in a room or in the hallway. Um, so if we look at, let me just grab one of these guys spin it so you can see it. Um, the top symbol uh, at the very top there is just telling you it's a it's a tier one. There's one pip there. The other thing that tells you it's a tier one is the color of the banner and the color of the chip. Um, those change by from, from floor to floor. Uh, the symbols on it, so we've got the three here. That is its movement stat. So when guards move, it'll move three spaces. Um, and then the eight is its awareness. Eight is a really high awareness. Oh, no. <laughs> but the bulldog, um, they also have um, patrol, like, objectives. Um, that's not the word I was going for, but whatever. So this dot here is telling you what kind of patrol he's on. Um, the bulldog actually doesn't move. That's what that dot means. Uh, he doesn't move unless he becomes aware of something. So if something falls within his, within his awareness, then he'll go check it out. But otherwise, he literally just stands there. And I see these like little green marks on the circles. I see you rotating them. I assume there's some kind of facing for their awareness, right? You can like sneak behind them. Yeah, exactly. That's just telling you which way um, that guard is supposed to start facing. Then we have, let's see what other kind of guards we have over here. Oh, we've got one of each. Uh, no, we don't quite. So we have the walker over here. It has a movement of four, but only an awareness of two. Um, and we'll talk about awareness in a second, but it's patrol is, yeah, so it's a perimeter guy. So essentially what that means is he always wants to keep a wall on his right hand side. So he would actually, um, turn to his right and start kind of taking this path all the way, all the way around, keeping the wall on his right hand side. Okay. And they don't go outside. They just... Nope. We'll, we'll start outside, but once we get inside the building, outside uh, becomes irrelevant. It's, yeah. I mean, that, that sounds like <laughs> most uh, corporate jobs, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, then we have the hamster here. So uh, guards that are in the hallway are going to do their patrols. Guards that are in rooms are just going to stay still. Unless, uh, they're kind of like the bulldog. They're going to stand still unless they have something to go investigate. But if this hamster was out in the hallway, um, he is, he's got the patrol type. He literally just walks in a straight line. Um, so if this was him, he would walk up to here and then he would turn around and walk oh, back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, unless something catches his attention. Anything that goes within aware, uh, guards awareness sort of supersedes it's patrol and it's going to go check that out. Now, is that a like distance rating? So if I get within two spaces of the walker, like right here, then he's aware of me. Yeah. So the way that it works, let's look at, um, let's look at this walker here. So it has an awareness of two. Uh, that is two spaces in a direct line uh, in front of him. And then you have that for any other square. So he can see here and here, and then he can also see one spot in any, uh, one spot in any other direction. So sorry, not that, not this spot. Okay, I was gonna say just this spot. You were like, no, no diagonals, no diagonals. No diagonals. <laughs> <laughs> um, the bulldog over here can see a full eight in front of him, so he can see like all the way down this hallway, and then he can see four in any other direction. Now, um, if he, it still doesn't go diagonal, right? So if he's here, I'm invisible to him right there. You're not because you are you you do still count orthogonally. Oh, crud. Okay. Um. So you'd go one, two, three, four. four. So he could see you all the way out to here. Now, how do uh, rooms interact with that? The way that that works is they can't see through doors, but if they see you, um, so let's say transmitter is here, for example. Uh, let's just grab 
his site token. So the site token is what you're going to leave in the last spot you were seen. If, for example, transmitter was here, uh, was here, which is within his line of sight, and then moved around this corner, you'd leave the site token um, there because that's the last spot this, uh, any guard saw you. Um, and that guard is now going to prioritize moving towards that site token. Now, how many guards prioritize that? Like, is this guy all only the way? Only one this... guard. Oh, only one. So only, only the guard that is closest gotcha. to anything will go investigate it. That's either somebody they can see or a site token, I assume? Exactly. So, that, so if, there's, if there's a bot in their site, they'll go after that first. Uh, second priority is going to be site token. And then third priority is just whatever their patrol is. And then you asked about doors. So the way that that works, um, if the bulldog can see you uh, in the spot that you're on, and then he would also, the, the like next square would also be within his site, then he sees you go into that room and you'd leave your site there and he'll follow you into that room. Every time you have to put your site token on the board, your threat goes up by one. As soon as a guard reaches one of your threat tokens, um, it gets pulled off the board again. But if it's on the board and then you get seen by something else, your threat simply moves and that doesn't spike threat. So that's kind of how the guards work. The players are going to take a full turn each and then all the guards are going to take a turn moving. You can move them in whatever order you want, which is, is kind of useful because you can, you can work something out where... Um, if this were the situation, you could choose this guard moves first, but he can't move because this one's blocking him. And then this one moves like that kind of thing. Objectives are, are just going to tell you what you need to do. We'll draw one. Uh, we'll draw two and select at least one to keep at the beginning of the game. And then if we wanted to, we could repeat that again. It's not I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for first timers. But what you could do is like draw two, keep one and then draw two more and keep one of those that you have two objectives that you're going for. Yeah, I was going to say, where is the other? I know there's one of those sets icons in the, uh, the big warehouse. There's one here in security. Oh, oh man. Um, <laughs> security sucks. The, warehouse, there, the warehouse looks uh, lovely to get into in security. <laughs> yeah, so those are the only two on this floor. Uh, sorry, there's also one here in control. Oh, actually, I just realized um, uh, is this, this is not a door. So to get to the warehouse, we'd have to like go through the lobby and then into the warehouse. Well, so we've got the lobby door. And then we've got the, there's an outside security door. And then there's, oh, uh, hold on a second. There's supposed to be an entrance. Well, here, let's take, uh, why don't we take one of your little red. Sounds, yeah, that's perfect. There we go. Throw, so now. A red little circle there. Yeah, and then we can change it to uh, a green one if we ever here. open it. <laughs> yeah, so it should be, a, should be a door there that we can go through. It's literally just says entrance and looks like this floor. So perfect. So we got three ways to get into the building. We should pick our objective first. Yeah, and then and then we got to learn about the network, right? End a turn while positioned to two different external corners of a floor. So one of the one of the four corners. Then I actually think that one's easier because we have to go to the we have to literally go to, we could go to the exact same warehouse space in either case, but um, we don't have to deal with the like cramped security room now. Clearly, it's not getting us the free surveillance, so it's not as good of an objective, right? Uh, correct. But yeah, I don't, I don't disagree that it's probably the, the easier one. So we'll just discard that one. We've got that. So once we complete that, we get on the elevator, and that's it for the floor. Um, y once you get that, you're allowed to get on the elevator. Um, you can you if if it's early and you want to putter around here, um, <laughs> trying to get crates and go on the network and yeah, trying yeah, to get yeah. crates and and do network stuff and and terminal stuff. Um, ultimately, collecting power is what you want to do because you want to get better abilities by the time you get to that second and third floor. Ready for the network? So sure. Uh, there's, there's four spots, one for each possible player. We've only loaded up two. I'm going to be purple. You're going to be black. The network itself is uh, represented by red. So the dice are called signal strength. The red little pegs are called pings. Um, and they start from the CEO here and, and, and work their way out. We start from the outside and are kind of trying to work our way in. We'll do, we'll talk about us first. 
If you manage to access the network, so say I did the wireless access with this physical, um, I'm going to move to the first node on the network on the outer ring that matches that symbol. So I would move to there. All right. And then uh, I do have to keep taking actions on the network. So I, I would move down to another one. And then I move to the next symbol that matches that. But um, these uh, signal points are, are kind of like stop signs. So I'm trying to get to the tech, but I stop on this uh, access point. Now, can I choose any of the three directions? So I could have gone to like that one right there. No, you have to move clockwise oh, and, okay. uh, and, and stop on the next one of that symbol. Um, but there are reasons that you, that you might skip on the burn cycle, just like with a normal, if these were, if these were swapped and that was your order, um, I might choose to like skip a shield and go down to text that I don't have to stop on these shields that like that kind of thing. Sometimes it could be advantageous. Stopping on these signal spots are a really good thing. That's kind of what you're going for. <laughs> um, so there's three different things you can do when you stop there. The first one is that you can decrease our team threat by one which is super great. There's very few ways to decrease threat. This is one of the main ones. The second thing you can do is you can increase your signal strength die by one. And we'll talk in a minute about what that die does. Um, and then the third thing you can do is you can allow uh, your buddies on the network to transfer. So if, uh, that didn't work. If you were sitting here, if I chose the transfer option, you could move yourself in a ring. So that's what you're doing on the network. Now, the nodes are kind of doing the same thing. Um, you, you mean the, the pings? Or sorry, yes, the pings. The, the spots are the nodes. The red things are the pings. Um, <laughs> so at the end of every round, every ping that's on the network is going to move two spots. So that would happen, and then that would happen. They always come out on this orange one. It's called the core. And if they can't come out, they just kind of wait their turn. So that would happen one turn. Do they transfer, like, up where the reds are? Um, no, yes, but using, using the access point just like we would. So on the next turn, you would move that one, and it would have to stop, and then this one, and it has to stop behind. And then they determine what they do by rolling the uh, network die. That, so that, that skull do. looks very friendly. I'm sure that's the best <laughs> result. It's great. So if they rolled this, uh, then all of the of the pings that can transfer get to transfer out. So that would result in them both transferring out. Um, if you rolled this, that increases their signal strength by one. And then if you roll the skull, then that increases your threat by one. Um, and you generally resolve the pings outside to inside and the ones with the most space in front of them go first. So you, you can't do what you do with the guards where you're like, well, this one can't move. And then this one moves. You kind of, yeah, you can't game it as much. Um, so you don't want pings on the board because they're landing on these spots and they're triggering bad things. Um, the way that you get them off is by getting, uh, getting next to them. So if I was here uh, and I went to move to a shield, then I move beside it. And then if my signal strength is strictly higher than theirs, I get to boot it off of the network. Um, so that not only gets rid of that, it gives you one power, but it decreases your signal strength then drops by one now and, and your movement halts in the space yeah. before where they were correct now what, what if um, they're at six <laughs> yep so if that same thing were to happen and you can't beat them on signal strength you get booted and their signal strength goes down oh my gosh okay so yeah. and, and, and 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 sorry <laughs> they're rolling that uh that kind of grayish black die every time they land an uh, individual ping lands on a red yep that, Okay. Wow. All right. <laughs> so you don't want a bunch of them out. Um, the 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 main way that they get out is from. Well, I was gonna say when we tracker. we have so when we three four, pings. That's when we're gonna have three pings out. Jesus. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 
that's that's how the network works. When you go to the network, you can spend as much of your turn on the network as you want. Um, but if you do something off network, then you can't go back to the network um, without accessing it again. So you kind of spend as much time as you want on the network consecutively. Um, but once you leave, you're done. And at the end of your turn, uh, you're, you're also done. You'd, you'd stay where you are, but if your next turn you wanted access again, you'd have to do it again, yeah. All right, and with that great rules explanation out of the way, we're going to take a break and we'll come back with another video with the actual playthrough of the first floor. So thanks for joining us at the One Stop Co-op Shop.